Perfect. Perfect. So um, we all oh, we're all coming in now. Yeah, I can see it ticking down. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where we're going to dive into the art of cyber manipulation. My name is Courtney Williams. I'm one of the email resilience specialists here at Bytes, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Kiri Addison from Mimecast. And just to give you some more context and not to steal Kiri's thunder, she will without a doubt do this more justice than I could do. Um, today, we're here to talk around the current and evolving threats within the email landscape and what you could do to protect your organization. Just some general rules of housekeeping. Um, for those of you that have not joined a Bytes webinar before, you will be muted throughout the presentations. But if there are any questions that you'd like to ask or submit, you'll see on the right hand side, there is a questions box where you can pop the questions in there and we'll cover these during the Q&A at the end. We do have a fair few attendees today, so uh, please rest assured that should we not get to your question this morning, we are not ignoring it and we will follow up with the relevant answers for you. And also this session is fully recorded and will be shared with you once we are finished. So feel free to share with this with colleagues that maybe can join today, um, but you feel it would be of interest and benefit too. As always as well, if we could ask that you please take the time to complete the feedback form as we want to ensure that these webinars that we host are, are relevant for our clients and that we're maximizing the, the precious amount of time that we do get to spend with you. So just by way of introductions, um, I've already said I'm, I'm Courtney Williams, the email re resilience specialist here at Bytes. I work with Mark Palmer here, who I'm sure a few of you will have had conversations with. And I will just pass over to Kiri to give a little bit of her background and her role at Mimecast. Hey, thanks, Courtney. So um, yeah, morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is Kiri Anderson. I'm the um, email efficacy product manager at Mimecast. So it's my job to make sure that we maintain very high levels of um, protection and detection for email based attacks. Um, previously to that, I was head of data science for threat intelligence at Mimecast. And before Mimecast, I worked for the UK government building systems to detect cyber attacks and fraud. Perfect. Thank, thanks for that, Kiri. Um, and now we will move on to the agenda just to show you what we'll be covering today. So we are going to be going over the current threats in the email threat landscape, um, so like such things as credential harvesting and file abuse and the evolving threats such as business email compromise and the defensive actions that you can take um, to protect your business. So I'm going to cut off my slides now and pass over to Kiri, who will bring her slides up. Thanks, Courtney. One second. Can you see my screen okay, Courtney? I can indeed, yeah. Cool, brilliant. Um, yeah, so today we're just going to take a quick look at um, some of the trends in email-based attacks. So it's what we're seeing as being like really big common problems in the threat landscape, as well as evolving threats and attacks. Um, so things to kind of keep an eye on and monitor, as well as some of the more unusual based um, things that our threat researchers have been seeing as well. So I'll also finish up by just talking about some ways that you can defend against those attacks. So just before we get into that, to set the scene, I kind of just wanted to give you an idea of the volumes of data that we uh, handle at Mimecast. So we process um, emails for almost 40,000 customers all over the globe. So we've got a lot of data, both malicious, non-malicious. Uh, these numbers that you can see here are monthly figures. So you know, billions of emails being processed every month, billions of URL clicks that we're analyzing, um, you know, millions of attachments being sandboxed and um, particular types of attacks like impersonation detections are just huge at the moment. So we'll just take a look at the current trends first. And these are the kind of attacks that we're seeing occurring in very high volumes at the moment. So the first big problem that we're seeing is the abuse of file sharing sites. And this is basically where attackers will um, use legitimate sites like SharePoint to provide a route to get to malicious content. 
Um, a variation on this is where they set up a new spoof domain, um, but the principle is the same really, they're abusing good reputation of these services and users trust in these brands to avoid detection. So a typical kind of attack will work like this. The attacker will um, send the victim an email with a link to a legitimate file sharing site. Um, and when the victim clicks that link, they're automatically gonna be redirected um, through that page to a malicious um, site where the aim is usually to uh, harvest users' credentials. Sometimes it's downloading malware, but what we see more of at the moment is definitely credential harvesting, um, as well as kind of automatic redirection, I should say as well. There could also be links that the user actually has to interact with and click on to get to that. So to solve that problem, um, basically we have to kind of follow that flow and get to that final content to analyze it and recognize it as dangerous. And this is an example of a real attack that we detected and blocked recently. So you see the user was sent an email with a link to Microsoft OneDrive and um, where the attacker was claiming that there was a PDF document for an outstanding invoice um, being hosted there. So the OneDrive page actually just contained a link that took them outside to a phishing site where the, att the attacker's intention was to steal email credentials. And you can see that they weren't really very picky about the kind of credentials, they take anything really. Um, and so if we take a look at some stats, and this is just over the first two weeks of September, these are where users have clicked on links within emails that took them to file sharing sites. Um, and those sites were blocked because we recognized that it was gonna basically take them to a phishing page. You can see that Microsoft SharePoint, OneDrive are on top. They're the most commonly abused sites. And it's not really surprising when you consider how widely used these services are and people's trust in those services as well. I think it's also interesting to see that the um, UK is the most targeted region here as well. So if we move on, this is the next big problem that we're seeing, it's credential theft. And I suppose really it's more about the kind of the aim of the attack. But over the last six months, we've identified and blocked over 84 million emails um, at the gateway where we identified the threat as being credential harvesting. So that removes kind of the bulk of the problem there at the gateway, but you can't just rely on blocking everything there, especially um, when we're talking about having links in email that, that will take you to those sites because quite often a link could come in clean, um, but it could be weaponized later on after it's been delivered or it's recognized as malicious later on. So that kind of the dynamic nature of URLs really. So we have multiple kind of layers of detection and um, specifically for this problem, we have something called credential theft protection. And basically what that does is when, an, when a user clicks on a link in an email, we send it off for some advanced analysis on that web page that it's gonna to go to. And we use a combination of things. So we look for the presence of a login form on a page. We also use computer vision to detect and pick out brand logos. Um, and there are other indicators of suspicion that we use as well. So we can tell if this is a legitimate page, um, you know, genuinely asking for your credentials, or if it's a fake one that's been designed to steal your credentials and trick you. So the chart you can see on the left here shows the uh, top 10 most impersonated brands um, for, I think it's one, yeah, May to June um, 21. So Microsoft still very much on top, as you'd expect, um, followed by Adobe, Adobe is quite an interesting one because it's actually kind of linked to the method of attack. So quite often um, you'll have this credential harvesting box and it will be placed on top of a kind of blurred out image of a PDF. So the user thinks that if they enter their credentials, then they're going to be able to see this you know, fake image, be some kind of invoice or interesting document that they think they need to see. So if we move on to, uh, yeah, the next one. So kind of thinking about the kind of you know, scams that we're seeing at the moment, we're still seeing COVID scams come through, not in such high volumes as we were seeing at the start of the pandemic in the first kind of few months to six months, but they're still going on. And they tend to follow whatever's in the media, um, the news at the time, so it's whatever problem is at the forefront of people's minds. So at the start of the pandemic, it was all about you know, where's the latest outbreak location, what are the latest symptoms? Um, so you'd see emails that said, you know, click here, um, to see the latest list of COVID symptoms that impersonate the World Health Organization typically. Uh, we then moved on to things like travel refund scams, uh, working from home policies. So it's just whatever people were worrying about at the time. And COVID really has been quite a gift um, for these cyber criminals because it's just provided a constant ongoing uh, stream of clickbait. 
in this example that you can see above, uh, it's quite a recent one. So it's talking about proof of vaccination being required to go back to the office against what people are thinking about. And they're using terminology like it's mandatory that, that you have to complete this by the end of the day. That's obviously to, you know, transmit a sense of urgency, which, which is a classic kind of tactic here. So, um, you know, you've also got a link to the um, company's current vaccination portal. If you click on that, you get taken to these pages, which are designed to steal your email credentials and your personal information as well. So if you notice, there's this uh, weird URL at the top. So that's a good point of detection for the end user if they were to actually notice it. I think we've got a quick poll question um, coming up now. Get that on the screen. Um, which is, do you share examples of real phishing emails with your users to raise awareness? Quite good. I've got one yes coming in, I think. Yeah, that's good. So this is quite a good um, strategy because, you know, um, these things are changing all the time. There's only so many templates you can kind of come up with and think of yourself and it keeps the kind of content fresh. More coming through. Okay, cool. So the majority saying yes, that's good. Thanks. I think I can. Okay. Let's see if I can remove this pool. Okay, sorry. Close that down now. Okay, so um, next problem that we're talking about is impersonation. You know, this is nothing new. We've been talking about it for a long time, but it's still a problem um, with millions of detections every month. So I think at the start that was showed us that like 41 million detections um, every month. And typically what you'll see is as a senior person within the organization, um, they're being impersonated and they go off and they ask an employee to help them with a task. So it often starts out quite brief as in this example. Um, and then they kind of carry on the dialogue by email. Sometimes they try to take them into a different channel like phone because it's harder to detect. Um, and so this example here is quite a brief one. Um, the one I, yeah, there was an example I presented a couple of years ago, uh, which was started off similar to this, but the attacker had actually emailed several employees in the same company. Um, turned out they were all working within the same office and when they got this email they started talking to each other about it and rather than um, it raising suspicion amongst them they all actually started working together collaborating to um, try and help the supposed CEO with his request which was to go and buy some gift cards and email him back the voucher codes so um, they actually ended up sending someone out of the office with petty cash to go and buy the gift cards for them so um, it's quite a kind of interesting using example, but yeah, this example above the employees involved were actually ones that you would expect to be in communication with each other. It wasn't sent out to everyone within the company. So these attacks can also be very targeted and quite hard to detect. And these ones really are a great use case for AI detection methods. And in terms of detection, this is the way we do it. So very simply, um, we use our cybergraph to learn normal patterns of communication for the organization. And then once you have that baseline of what's normal, you can then identify the unusual communication or the anomalies on top of that. And um, you may know one of the major problems with anomaly detection, if you kind of you know, tried to implement it, use it yourself, is that the potential volume of detections can be really overwhelming. Um, you can get a lot of you know, false positives as well. So kind of combat that and to minimize that what we do is we also combine this um, with other indicators of suspicion as well so for example in the previous email that we showed yeah, so we could detect the kind of anomalous communication part so the fact that the recipient had never received an email from that person before but we'd also be able to kind of tell that that sender email address was from a newly registered domain so that's one of our indicators of suspicion. So we take a hybrid approach and we combine AI with high fidelity indicators so that we're creating robust signals, um, not an overwhelming kind of volume of them. And then once we have that signal of suspicion or potential danger, 
what we do is we add a banner to the email so that the end user can see that okay cybergraph thinks this email may be suspicious or dangerous but we also um, add the explanation as to why we think that. So then the user has the information that they need to make an informed decision. And they can then choose to report this email um, as malicious or mark it as safe. And that user feedback is very, very valuable data. Um, we can crowdsource that intelligence. So as I said, often attackers will send a similar email to a few people within the company, um, like in that previous example. And if the users start to report that as malicious, um, then that banner would change from suspicious to dangerous. So as well as kind of, you know, technology like this to detect anomalies, user awareness is very important. Uh, and having that kind of big dynamic banner there that clearly explains the potential danger um, can make users think twice before applying. Next, we're going to talk about some kind of evolving threats. I can advance the screen yeah here we go um yeah so basically as i'm sure you know threat actors always improving um and they're streamlining their operations basically so they get a higher success rate or um you know greater spread to maximize their monetary gain so this first example um, was an interesting one that we spotted a few weeks ago so um, i mentioned credential theft earlier and this is what's happening with some of those email credentials so it's business email compromised BEC. Now, these scams, they're nothing new. Um, the aim is to obtain some fraudulent payment, usually a wire transfer. And many of the groups uh, we see, or most of them, in fact, operate pretty manually. They have teams of people. Um, they're usually working from Africa. Um, but over the last three months, we've observed a new operation. It's a really interesting one because the group behind it are pretty technic technically capable. And they're actually using automation um, to send out high volumes of customized targeted spear phishing campaigns rather than doing it all manually. And um, what they'll do here is they'll impersonate a senior member of the company and they'll request their help making a payment. So it's pretty brief to start with. And what we see is that they usually use compromised Office 365 accounts. Um, so that's what they're doing with all those credentials that they're sealing. Uh, again, it's all about abusing a trusted service with a good reputation um, because that basically means they can avoid those messages getting rejected at the gateway. You can see here on the left um, stats show that they've gone through almost 4,000 um, email accounts within a few months, and they've used those to send around 20,000 emails. So if you look at the graph on the right, it illustrates that you know, typically they'll only use each account a handful of times, and this is so that they can go under the radar. If the victim does reply to one of these automated emails, what we Kind of tend to find is that they go to a centralized point um, where they'll be followed up manually and they only really need quite a small percentage of these attacks to be successful to start making a decent amount of money out of this it's quite an interesting um kind of find for us and i think it really highlights you know, the prudent um the problem with those office uh 365 potential harvesting if you just look at you know how many accounts they have access to and they can burn through So the next example, the slide, yeah, um, it's kind of another good evolution to highlight is the um, increasing layers of evasion or obfuscation that some threat actors are using in their attacks. So it's the kind of traditional cat and mouse game, really. And this example here is you know, a really good one for showing the lengths that some of these kind of threat actors have to go to now to compromise an endpoint to get some malware on the victim's machine. So. Um, you can see the email here, it comes in with a password protected zip file. There's not much in the body, but it does say that there's some important information to lure the victim in. Um, because it's a, the attachment is a password protected archive file, most scanners, or well, automated scanners, they can't kind of you know, open it up because they don't have the password. So you basically have to be able to examine the email before, find the password and put it in to extract that content before you can pass it to the scanners. So. Uh, we have technology that can do this automatically, but let's assume you don't have that. The email is delivered to the end user. They can then open up the attachment, input the password, get access to that zip file. And what you find inside that zip file is a Word document. Um, this Word document doesn't look like there's much to it, but 
but what it actually contains is a macro that then will automatically create an encrypted um, HTML application file. Uh, it then ac executes that file, connects to a URL and downloads a malicious payload, um, which we'll look at shortly. But the kind of interesting thing here is that they're using an open source tool on GitHub, um, which describes exactly you know, how this technique works, how to execute it. In the overview page, it says, um, you know, this is an evasion technique, which is used to get around content and file type inspection. So we've got some pretty advanced threat actors here who are just using open source tools freely you know, available on GitHub. If you look at the document in more detail, like I said, there's not much to it, but you'll notice the instructions here. Um, it's a pretty standard kind of technique and message that we see in most of these, and it's just to trick the end user into letting macros run if they don't automatically when the document's opened. Um, so apart from that, like I said, the, the document's pretty blank. So kind of looking at, your, at that, you're thinking, well, what goes into that HTML application file that this macro inside it is creating um, and executing? You know, how is it going to know where to go um, to, to grab that, you know, that payload? I don't see a URL in here or anything. So you can take a, a look at the macro behind it and, you know, the answer has to be in there. So if we delve kind of into the document a bit deeper and we look at that macro, uh, this is what you see. So you can get a reference to the, um, this HTA file, HTML application file that's being created. Um, but again, you know, there's not much going on here. So we need to look for some more clues. And the clue here is in this, um, this part of the text where it says active document.range.txt. So that suggests that the content of this HTA file is somewhere in that document. But if we go back to the document again, well, you know, there's not really very much to see. So where is it getting that text from? And all they've done, if you kind of select all, um, change the font size, you'll see that all they did was actually make the text very small and white. So they've hidden that content within the document there. So I guess you'd like to think that your users, if they saw a document looking like this, and they would have you know, definitely thought it was a little bit more sus than suspicious and not enabled those macros, but you never know. So in red is highlighted the content that goes into that HTML application file, which is then executed um, and will go off and grab the malware. But when you look at it, it's still, you know, it doesn't really make much sense, does it? So what they've actually done is to base 64 encode it to make it harder to analyze. So another layer of kind of evasion deception there. So we can base 64 decode that um, quite easily. So, okay, it still looks a bit like nonsense, but if you just spend a few seconds um, looking through the code, what you will actually eventually pick up is um, what looks like a URL. So going from right to left, you can see HTTP, um, but see you'll, you'll see that the URL is reversed. So more kind of evasion obfuscation there. So all we do is just reverse the content. And then finally, you can see the code that they're actually running to go off and get that. So you can pick out the key bits to figure out what they're doing here. So they're making a get request um, to this URL. So it goes off to this place, grabs the content, which is the malware, then saves it to a file and executes it. So also what you'll notice is that rather than saving it as an executable file, um, which is quite standard behavior, they're saving it as a JPEG. And that's because the JPEG you know, is an image file, so it's much, much less likely to be recognized um, as a potential, potentially dangerous file type and blocked like an executable would be in a lot of cases. So many, many layers of obfuscation and evasion there involved in getting that malware onto the end user's device. Um, so in the end, well, what was that malware? So it's a banking trojan. The aim of it is to steal your financial information, your credentials. And this one is actually operated by a pretty sophisticated, um, financially motivated criminal group. They've got a number of aliases there that you can see in the tags. So I think TA551 is probably the most well known out of them. Um, this group is a, you know, an interesting one. They target English, German, Italian, Japanese speakers typically. We see them at the moment heavily targeting UK customers with spear phishing emails and again using compromised accounts. And you can see on the graph on the right that they tend to run these sporadic campaigns because what they're doing is constantly updating, iterating, improving their methods. So they'll send out a few thousand emails and then they'll pause for a bit while they make improvements. And a lot of these criminal groups, especially the ones that are offering malware or ransomware as a service, they operate um, you know, 
it's like a tech company really so many of them will have customer support they even have victim support so you can go online and have live chats with them and they'll help you figure out how to make your bitcoin payments uh, so it's really professional so those were the kind of evolving threats the common threats and then to finish up i had two um, unusual techniques that we've seen so we have a team of threat researchers who are constantly monitoring for new and emerging types of attacks uh, so that we can kind of put mitigations in place and block things before they become a big problem. And uh, they actually picked out these as a couple of their favorites over the last few months. This first technique, um, the split archives, is used to bypass or trick really attachment scanning. So the attachment on the email will take the form of a split archive. There are you know, legitimate use cases for split archives. They used to break down big files into smaller chunks. And um, it's you know, quite handy because clicking on any one of those small chunks from the archive file tool, like um, WinRAR, I think this one is, will automatically reconstruct and open the whole, whole file. So the threat actor behind this one had actually figured out a way to abuse this function. Um, so they used it to split a malware file into two pieces. So this created a split archive which they could then attach to the email. Uh, and because you know, security scanners don't typically have that inbuilt functionality to be able to reconstruct split archives, they won't be able to reconstruct the attachment as it comes through. Um, they won't recognize it as malware, so they let it through to the end user. So the end user gets that email with the attachment, they open it up, click on any one of those chunks, um, and it executes the malware as normal. So. Um, yeah, our researchers were quite impressed with this one. They thought it was a nice kind of innovative way to bypass scanning. The second example um, we have here is ransomware. And, you know, you're probably saying like, well, what's unusual about ransomware? Because that's all I ever hear about now. Uh, but what is unusual about this is that it's actually attached directly to the email. So you rarely ever see that if it does come via email. What you normally see is a, a Microsoft Office document attachment um, or a link to a document that will contain a macro similar to that previous example. Uh, so that macro will make an outbound connection, download what's normally some kind of Trojan uh, like piece of malware onto the end user's device. They'll do that initial compromise. They'll then spend some time moving laterally through the network um, and aggregating, exfiltrating data before finally launching a ransomware attack. And that could be days, weeks later. So we rarely see it attached to an email like this, but it does still happen occasionally. Uh, so I just wanted to, to finish up really by looking at kind of um, how to defend against these types of attacks. So here are some of the kind of key things, top tips that you can do to boost your defenses specifically against these. So the first kind of big area is user awareness. So this is um, yeah, massively important is pretty much all types of attacks need some kind of human interaction for them to be successful. Uh, the things you can do right now are to you know, share your share with your users examples of these attacks. So um, particularly let them know that they need to treat file sharing sites with extra caution. Be on guard if they're um, asked to input their credentials. That's a really prominent attack vector right now. And going back to the COVID example, um, you know, a successful attack there. We found really relies on the victim kind of being confused, being unsure. They don't know what the company policy is. Um, so they click on that link to find out. So sharing information about policies and procedures can really, really help reduce the chances of them um, falling for a scam like that. Oh, and finally, uh, thinking back to impersonation attacks and anomaly detection, making sure that your end users have the context to make good decisions is key. If they don't know why something might be bad, um, it's really much harder for them to make the right, right decision. So obviously it's not all about the end user, um, having the right technical solutions in place is very important, of course, as well. Uh, so I've got the Mimecast detection funnel up here just because it's a good as illustration of the layered approach to security. And so really that means that basically you can knock out, you know, the less sophisticated um, attacks, the, the majority of attacks with the less advanced tech. Um, but then you also need you know, the, the protection kind of further down the funnel against the more advanced threats or the evolving threats and maybe some of those specific use cases um, as they crop up. So 
you know, if we think back to credential theft, the bulk of the detections here were in our spam detection layer, so 84 million in six months. But then we used some advanced uh, analysis on the URLs to pick up the more sophisticated attacks, which are much smaller in volume, but you know, obviously still have a massive impact potentially as well if they get through. And um, in terms of specific solutions relating to the threats that we've looked at, the kind of key ones are really advanced URL inspection at the point of click. Um, because things, as I mentioned earlier, can be delivered clean, weaponized later on. Um, and also, you know, I say advanced because detecting some of these problem areas at the moment, like the used file sharing sites um, and credential harvesting pages are pretty complicated problems or use cases. Um, also, anomaly detection for, for impersonation attacks is a really kind of key area at the moment. Um, and finally, in terms of attachment inspection, um, we find that Static file analysis and sandboxing are really good at uh, identifying those malicious documents with macros in, and these are, you know, huge common, uh, hugely common attack vector as well. So finally, um, kind of, if you've got the what you can do in a more I say, strategic way, so you've probably heard, you know, over ninety percent of attacks start with email. Um, you know, while that's true, and Minecast is a you know, predominantly an email security company as part of your overall resilience strategy. You don't just want to focus solely on blocking emails and content or links within them. So while that's very important to cover, um, you, know, you can't just focus on that initial entry vector. And you need to make sure that you're protected against or able to defend and recover from um, other stages of the attack should you become compromised. So the question here is then, well, given you know, limited resources, uh, limited budget, what do I focus on? And this is where you can use quite targeted um, threat intelligence to make those enhancements risk-based decisions. So, uh, for example, I mentioned earlier that threat actor TA551, the one using all those layers of evasion, obfuscation to deliver the banking trojan, well, that's very prominent in the UK at the moment. So you could use a TI framework like um, the one kind of I'm displaying here, which is the MITRE attack framework, uh, to understand what the, you know, the whole TTPs of that particular actor. You can then take that and map it against your own defences, and that way you can quickly see have I got any gaps that I need to cover off um, to improve my overall resilience against this very active threat actor in the UK at the moment. Uh, and you can also go beyond that, so you could do this for multiple threat actors, overlay all of the um, MITRE kind of framework maps, um, and then overlay that with your defensive map. So then you get this kind of hot spot of areas to prioritize and focus and to make this even easier MITRE has just released that defend framework uh, this maps the attack techniques to defensive countermeasures as well so it's very new it's something that they're still developing uh, but I think it's going to be a really handy tool and I'd encourage um, you or your security teams to go and check it out oh and now we've got yeah one final poll question so this is what type of intelligence framework do you use so we've got a few different options here, MITRE ATT&CK, KILL CHAIN, DIAMOND, OTHER, OR NONE. So we've got MITRE seems to be most popular at the moment. I think you can probably guess what my favourite is. Anyone using KILL CHAIN or DIAMOND? Okay. We've got, I think that's probably got all the results in. Um, I'd be quite interested to hear um, what the others kind of other frameworks are. If anyone wants to, the one person who put other, if they want to come off mute maybe for a second and just say what they were using. No, nope, maybe they're, they've been muted. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so we've looked at some trends in the threat landscape, um, some evolving techniques, some of the more unusual attacks as well. Uh, and then we discussed some def defensive tactics or countermeasures that you can kind of use to improve your overall cyber resilience. So we should have a few minutes, I think, for questions now, if there are any, um, and I'll hand back to Courtney. Lovely, thanks, Kiri. Um, I'll just share my screen again.
perfect. So um, hopefully now you should all be able to see my screen. And thank you very much, Kiri. That was really useful and a very insightful session around the, where things are going. And I, I found it incredibly interesting. So thanks for that. Um, as I said at the start, there is a questions box on the right hand side. Um, if we have any questions, I did have one myself. Um, do you do you have any more examples of recent phishing emails that could be sent out to users to raise awareness? Um, yeah, so we kind of um, have quite a lot of examples. But if you go to the Mimecast website, look at our blog. Um, we also do kind of regular webinars kind of every month, um, three different regions. Um, so we have kind of really quite a few examples that you can pick out of those. Um, for more kind of, I suppose, a regular kind of user awareness type thing, we have a product called Safe Fish, which um, comes as part of our user awareness. And, and what that does is it takes the um, actual phishing emails that have gone into your environment makes them safe and then makes them available for you to send out to your users. So you're actually using, you know, real fresh examples rather than trying to you know, think of templates which are going to trick your users, but may actually not be reflecting what's going on kind of in the threat landscape at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Is there any, any further questions at all from anyone? We'll just give it maybe 20 seconds or 30 seconds. No, all quiet. No, all good. Cool. Well, I'll move on for now. If there are any questions that you 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 might have, um, please feel free to to send to myself, um, and we can get answered for you as well. So, I suppose the the call to action, and obviously we've we've spoken about CyberGraph today, and some some of the benefits the CyberGraph user is obviously using AI and machine learning technology to that gets smarter over time and delivers in context alerts to employees at the point of risk. So if you do want to find out more, or if you'd like to book a dem demo or proof of concept, then please let your account managers here at Bytes know, or you can reach out to myself and I, I can get that organized for you. But unless there's any other questions, then I think we are done. So. If I could once again ask you to fill out the feedback forms, um, but thank you very much again, Kiri, for your time this morning, and thank you to everyone who attended. Hope you found it as useful as I did, and hopefully look forward to seeing you again on a future 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 session. Can't get my words out. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you all again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. I'll finish.